I want to talk to you today about global. We're at Global AppSec DC, right? There are Global AppSec San Francisco or Lisbon this year, as we just heard. Global, what does that mean? And who's in and who's out? Now, one of the things I can't do anything about is my age. I can't. Um, are you queuing up my slides, please? Ah, there we go. Yes, global. And let's see if this clicker works. I'm pressing the button. Button, 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 button. Um, I can't do anything about my age. So those of you who want to say, OK, Boomer, please, go, go on your phones. Because something that happens to you is you grow older. But the thing about it is, and I'm hoping this actually works because I want to cue the next slide. Come on. It just says global, by the way. Um, it gives me a little space because I'm not climbing a career ladder anymore, or at least not much. Um, I'm less, I'm pressing this button. Please make it happen. Maybe you can drive if you don't mind. Can we go to the next slide? He's trying to fix it, um, and I don't want to waste your time. I hate wasting people's time. Um, this is, by the way, a, uh, that, that picture. I really aspire to that when I get a little more wrinkled. Um, there. Uh, his name is Malik Afegbua. He's a Nigerian artist, and uh, he designed a whole bunch of clothes for older people, like me. Um, so I loved that. Um, who's in, really? Who's in this room? Who's not in this room? What's our state in AppSec? These are questions I've been mulling for a while. And can you go to the next slide, please? Ah, who's in? Is this, ah, let's go back. Come on. It doesn't really matter. They're both good pictures. I did want to talk about that last one. Uh, 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 not good. Uh, here, here we go. Who's in? This looks like any city, right? You all familiar with this kind of a scene? Ready to wear clothes, puffy jackets, a metro, right? That, that, that should be normal. When we, we often talk and we say, the enterprise, these folks may be working in enterprise. This is pretty familiar. Yeah, we're good. Um, it's actually Kiev during an air raid, just so you know. Um, and I do want to touch, and I thank you, Grant, very much for touching on this. If you think that what's going on in the world isn't affecting, there are people who are not here because of whatever geopolitical situation. And I, I don't want to go into the politics. That's not my point. Um, I'm just saying Ukraine was a uh, uh, computer science powerhouse, and most of those folks don't have time right now to help. Um, a lot of cyber goes on there. Um, here's another one. Come on. Pop. There we go. Um, you know, could be street party in any city. Still looks pretty familiar. Everybody with, with me? I circled all the smartphones in this picture. I may not have gotten them all. Um, you know, it's actually Chicago. It's a street party. So, you know, typical, really normal, what we expect, who we think of. Um, if you advance to the next slide, because I'm pressing the clicker and nothing's happening. Thank you. I think this picture says it all. Just look at this picture for a moment. Really take it in. This is the world we live in, actually. Right here. This is a National Geographic picture, by the way. I want to give them credit. Um, you know, these folks are not living in my bubble, I'll tell you. Uh, well, I do live in Montana. And people do ride horses to move livestock in Montana on a regular basis. But still, this is not my bubble. But you do see that they all have smartphones in their hands. OK? You do see that, right? This is the world we're living in. 
Next slide, please. Another picture, just this is from the University of Colorado, um, just to give them credit for their picture. Uh, you know, normal conversation on my smartphone. I don't know where this is, it doesn't matter. This is humanity today. Next slide, please. In fact, for about half of us on this planet, they're called the unbanked, sort of a rude term, but it's called the unbanked. People are using their phones for their financial transactions. They move those herds that we just saw because now they can get the actual weather coming in off the web. This is a huge, huge, big movement amongst humans. Really big. Really big. I'm going to bring this around to AppSec, don't you worry. Um, huge. About half of us. In fact, in places where fiat currencies are very unstable, people really prefer to get paid in crypto because their value, whatever that is, will be the same tomorrow as it was today. They don't have to run out quick and buy their bread because the prices are changing rapidly in a thousand percent inflation situation. Yeah, next slide, please. And remember, a smartphone is what? It's a modem, yeah. It's a CPU, it's an operating system. <laughs> we all took, most, many of us at least, took computer science uh, CPU architecture, right? And, you know, it's that. That's what it is. It's a CPU. It's an operating system. Thank you very much. So, like it or not, about seven billion, now there are, but read a bunch of studies in prep for this, which is my process, the way I do this, is I, you know, really dig down and say, is what I think real? And by the way, that's research, right? It's not going and finding things that agree with me. It's like, what is the reality? And you go and you do research, right? Um, I have something to say about biases in a minute. Um, software really has eaten human existence in a very interesting way. Software. About seven billion of our eight billion. Mas o menos. I don't know, you know, there are different things. Could be 5.8, could be six something, could be seven, different, different research says a different number. But let's just, for the sake of argument, say most humans are now dependent on software. Are you with me? Most humans are dependent on software. That's what we do, right? We try to secure that stuff. I don't know about like large languages eating our lunches just quite yet. That's a different talk, which I've given a bunch of times this fall. But if you want me to come and do that talk, yeah, let me know. So is this one gonna work? We are having trouble with the, okay. So the question, to misquote Shakespeare, is to global or not to global? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he's rolling in his grave if we knew who he was, actually. Um, but let's think about how many programmers there are on planet Earth, just against our seven billion using software, right? How many programmers are producing that software? Well, Evans data estimates about 27 million. That's a pretty good number. Let's, let's assume that's correct, although the GitHub number is much larger, but on the other hand, how many of you have multiple accounts on GitHub? <laughs> yeah, a few of us. And how many of those accounts are actually orphaned? Because you left that job, but you didn't close the account, and the company didn't, right, a few of us, right? So I, I wouldn't trust that 100, 100 million number. But it's somewhere between 27 million and 100 million. Can we go with 50 million? Are you willing, willing this is the, you know, a finger to the wind kind of guess? 50 million programmers. How many of them work at an enterprise? What we think, go back to that first slide, the picture of the people in a metro station, wherever that is. How many do you think? We don't know, by the way. 
But I, I'm pretty sure it's not 27 million. When I start adding up all the programmers that were at Intel and Cisco, how many engineers, and start thinking about Fortune 2000, what guesstimate, a really rough guesstimate, generous would be five million. And the reason I'm giving you these numbers, and if it's seven million, it doesn't matter. If it's three million, because what about the other 20 million programmers? What about them? They are those who are in daylight right now or who are working are busy writing vulnerabilities as I stand here speaking to you. Right? You with me? They are doing the work. They are trying to produce software that's useful and they're not, they don't know probably how or what AppSec is all about. How many of you uh, have gone to a company or a crew of developers and they say, so what do we do? They're starting at zero. How many have that experience in here? Starting at zero, fair number. Yeah, well, as, as uh, in my older years, I've started to consult because I actually don't want to work 60 hours a week anymore. I'm done. Um, you know, I'm, I'll be 73 in, in two weeks. So I'm, I'm really done with the 60 hour a week thing. I did that for, for almost 40 years. So uh, that's the end of it. I just don't, I don't have that much time left on my clock. So uh, I have other things to do, you know, like grandkids and fishing, those important things. Um, anybody who knows me knows I'm an avid skier. So uh, yeah. But they're not working at those places, though they're working that hard. So, yeah, we have a lot of programmers who their AppSec people are non-existent. Does anyone think that's a problem? This is global. I'm, this is global AppSec DC, right? This is global. Does anyone think that's a problem? I do. All right, um, if I can't make the next slide, I'm just gonna ask you to run it to the next slide because I wanna keep this moving. Yeah, so who's not here? How many people here consider themselves primarily dev or engineering, not security? Couple, look around, everybody look around. Look around because I want you to see. A few, not the majority in this audience. How many people are faculty or scientists who write code in this room? I do not see one hand, but do they write, so, ah, there, great, fantastic, you're representing, you know. Um, we're, we're all gonna come and talk to you all day long. Uh, no, very unfair, I'm sorry. Um, but they write code, right? Do you think that code has security requirements? Some of it, for sure, right? Um, but let's say, who's a maker? Who considers themselves primarily a maker? I can't see in the light there. I don't think I see any hands. Okay, and how about no code, low code? I'll bet they're not here. I'll bet they're, do we have a low code, no code person? Oh, perfect, so you're representing that, you know. But seriously, as we move to low code, no code, as, as people finally realize, oh, I, I could just ask Copilot to, or chat GPT to give me that little piece of Python that will, that will do something, but I have no training or understanding of what it does. Actually, I'm just gonna change the variable name and pop it in, or you tell it what the variable names have to be, and it'll do that. I know, because uh, I'm not a very good Python programmer. Mine looks just like all the C I wrote. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, if you look at my Python, it looks like C. Uh, that should not be a surprise. I've written hundreds of thousands of lines of C, C++. I've written maybe 400 lines of Python. You know, uh, I need this little utility. And having a GPT or a, something that'll do that for me, and I go, oh, yeah, yeah, I just, 
stick it in here. That's great, really great. But imagine the people who do not teach CPU architecture and OS architecture at a university, which I do. They're not going to have a clue whether the code is correct and certainly not the AppSec. Anybody worried about that? Because I think we're going to have an explosion of coders or not coders, programmers. Somebody made the distinction between a coder and a programmer last night to me in a conversation I was having. And I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, we're going to need some word boundaries here, I think. Word boundaries, because, right? Because we're going to have to distinguish from people who ask a GPT for code and people who understand what a stack is and what a heap is and, you know, we already have some of those problems. So, yeah. Um, next slide, please. And here's the fundamental, right? You with me? I mean, you can go and all look at the Wikipedia page about the halting problem and the Turing proof and what Turing complete languages are. I'm not going to do that. Sometimes in my talks I talk about that stuff. Today I'm not going to bother. If you want to know what I'm talking about and why software breaks, why it is a fundamental prob uh, problem with software, I suggest you go look at the Turing proof. It's stood since 1936, one of Alan Turing's fabulous and important contributions, not Benedict Cumberbatch. Okay? Um, next slide, please. Better to say all software breaks. And sometimes when it breaks, attackers take advantage of it. That's why we're here, right? That has given me not just a living, but a purpose and a direction in my life. The fact that I'd like people to use software, or as John Stewart once said as we were both catching a plane to go talk at a, at a conference, uh, we, we met at the airport, and uh, I said, John, I, you know, I want to, I want to, I think we need to protect the internet. And he said, heck, if the stuff could just be usable. And I thought, yeah, that's it. Next slide, please. So is this a celebration? Are we winning? Are the attackers running scared and there hasn't been a breach for the last, oh, 10 minutes? I mean, year? Or are we struggling? And was there a big breach this week? I, I, I've been busy in traveling and stuff, so I haven't been paying attention. Um, and there is other news that's captured my attention at this moment. Um, so I want to ask, importantly, what are we missing? Who are we missing? Are there new problems? And what are our continuous frustrations, OK? I want to kind of take stock. So here we are, global. I hope I've convinced you, as you take this journey with me, that there are people who are underrepresented or not represented here and who we are not covering with our practice. People who write code. Next slide, please. Let's take stock fundamentally. Now, this is an advert, the thing on the, it'll be your right of that slide. That's an advert that came on the same day as that headline. Okay? AT&T were advertised, I don't know how I got on their list, from speaking at conferences. <laughs> you speak at these conferences and what happens is then for five, six months, every vendor who was at the conference or who bought the list sends you and you have to unsubscribe. That's what, like one of my jobs, the first job in the morning is to unsubscribe from yet another <laughs> vendor list. Um, it's a very useful task. Uh, vendors, please don't. I'm not your prospect. Um, but you know, if somebody sends me, I will tell you this. If somebody sends me something really insulting, like they're trying to explain the basics of software security to me, they do get a note back. That's not the best way to approach your customer. But, you know, uh, nevertheless, um, that, that, that advert I got on the very same day AT&T had to announce losing 70 million records, including mine. 
I now get lots of, hey, Mary, is that you? Texts. You know, that's the start of a Yahoo Boys fish. Is uh, text fish is the to just try to start some conversation that's a mistaken text and then oh you're nice and by the way can you send me a hundred dollars yeah that's how it works there's a great Wired article that that explains the whole thing if you're interested um, but AT and T so the usual security response is oh they don't know what they're doing can we let that arrogance go please. Can we just step back? I have heard that for the last 25 years. Oh, they don't know what they're doing. Or those d developers are dumb. I have met some incompetent developers. I have. I have worked with thousands, tens of thousands of developers in my career. But they've been few and pretty few and far between. I've also worked with absolutely mind-numbingly brilliant people that made me feel about this big because I'm so dumb and couldn't get what they were saying. And so let's let go of that, please. Are you willing to let go of that? And think about this as a foundation to what this event as a foundation. AT&T are one of the original backbone companies of the internet. Think how long they have been doing security, information security, call it what you will, cyber, digital security. Think how long they have been doing it. It's fundamental to their business process. And I asked them, do you use your own managed service provider? Do you eat your own dog food? The answer, of course. What if this is the state of our art? I just ask you, what if this is the state of our art? That even competence, let's not call them great, I don't know, I've never used their services, I don't know, but certainly at it for a long time, they should know how to do information security. Remember, they secure the backbone, you know, so all the governments can tap it. Oh, I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> but seriously, they secure the backbone and have been since the backbone became commercial, which I think is in the 80s. And they were doing telephone communications in way before that, right? Nobody's perfect. And they still lost 70 million records on the same day they sent me this advert. It was the same week that T-Mobile, another one of my suppliers, lost 30 million records. So I'm in double trouble in one week. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, um, if this is the state of our art, this is the best we can do. And I'm not saying it is, I'm just posing the question. It's a possibility, right? Rather than saying, oh, they're dumb. They don't know what they're doing. They should pen test all their code. Yeah, we're gonna get to that. Um, that's another one I've heard for the last 25 years. Um, next slide, please. Beware the biases. These will kill us. I'm not going to explain all of these. I'm not going to do anything with this. I'm just going to throw this in front of you and say, please, let's beware biases. And we all have them. We all have them. Everyone in this room, me, absolutely. I got my biases. We got to beware of them. Because they will stop us from doing a good job. Ah, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, I can control it myself. And also beware Dunning-Kruger. Everyone in here is a great driver, right? <laughs> this is why driving is so much fun. Who, who, who conducts a vehicle? As a, you know, at least sometimes. Most of us, right? Um, and again, I'm going back to this bubble, right? Uh, it's called Dunning-Kruger, and if you're not familiar with Dunning-Kruger, we learn something enough to be s enough competent, and we think we're masters. This is, this is a very provable piece of social science. And then, as we learn, we realize how bad we are, and then you begin to climb up what, you know, um, they call it plateau of state, whatever. Um, 
you get competence. And that's why not all people who are really good at a thing are a little bit humble about it, but a lot of people are. And we'll say, oh yeah, um, I, I, I've led a bunch of AppSec programs and, you know, Vandana is sitting right here and she's amazing. And I've got Isar in terms of threat modeling who just blows my mind. And Chris Romeo, I mean, I've got some peeps right here who are my friends who just blow my mind. And I'm going to get to you, Tanya, don't you worry. Um, <laughs> right? Uh, there are people in this room who make me feel about this big a lot of the time because they're so amazing. Okay? And, and yet they're the humblest people that I know because they actually know there's someone else who knows just as much or more. Um, here's some examples of our, our, our problems. Um, everyone works at an enterprise. Everyone does not. I hope I just proved to you that everyone does not work at an enterprise. Right? And so whatever solutions we have that will only work at an enterprise, don't work for them. I hear this all the time. I'm, I'm on a bunch of industry groups, and people who work at enterprises all the time will say, well, at an enterprise, and I'm like, always the gadfly who says, wait a minute. Not everybody works at an enterprise. Um, there's the follow the herd examples. Uh, that's probably how AT&T managed to lose my records. Um, I'm not going to go into that, but talk to me about CVSS out in the halls. Happy to disabuse you of using that as a risk measure. It doesn't work, um, provably so. Uh, but my favorite is we have to pen test all the code. I have been hearing this for my entire security career, which is now running 25, 26 years, okay? And I've been in high tech for 40. Um, so uh, think about it. Think about how many pen testers we'd need to do the mountain of software we have, or the mountain of software you have at your companies, if you had to pen test every line of that code every time it changed, we would put 90% of the businesses out of business. There aren't that many. And is every pen tester equally skilled? We can just replace one with another, with another, with another. I remember years ago, I was talking to Alan Paller, who is now passed on, unfortunately, a great mentor for me. And I was suggesting that maybe there were 10,000 people who could do that work. And he said, not nah, Brooke, 1,000. Well, I, there are a lot more pen testers on the planet now than there were in 2008 when he said that to me. But still, skilled pen testers, how many do you have at your job? There are, of course, a lot of people who finish their ethical hackers, and I'm not dissuading you from finishing your ethical hackers. If you don't know how to do at least a little hacking and understand the, the, what goes on, it's very hard to do threat modeling, just so you know, um, because you have to understand how things work uh, in order to protect them. So, you know, I encourage you to take those courses. Absolutely. That's not what I'm saying. But you might not be ready just yet to hang up the $1,000 an hour shingle. Um, so sorry, Alyssa, if you're in the room. But I couldn't find a better picture of a CISO going, yeah, yeah, D yeah, well, uh, why should I make that investment? So I used my friend Alyssa Miller, who is fabulous, by the way. And if she's around and you see her and she is going to do a keynote, come to her keynote and you know, talk to her. She's fabulous um, and brilliant. Uh, but you got to, I know we have to, when we, we say something, we have to make, you know, our execs, I do understand that reality. I've been in, you know, the security business now for 20 some years and, and I get it. Okay. I've never been a CISO. I don't want that job, by the way. If you aspire to be a CISO, just remember your weekends and nights are shot. Um, every incident comes along, you're going to be talking to the board about it if it's serious, um, and at their pleasure, not yours. Um, so yeah, uh, we do have to do that. That's important. So we have some challenges that I want to bring before you. One of these I've been talking about since, from stages since 2008, and people may be getting tired of me talking about this, but it's cost lockout. 
So I spent about an hour and a half at a conference uh, some weeks ago in California talking to the GitHub folks. They have some amazing plans. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm vendor neutral, but I just want to say I was really impressed. They're really thinking about security, which is good since so much code is there and so many people use them. It's fabulous. Um, but then the, came the clincher and they say, yeah, and it's 10 bucks a month per user. Now, for those of you in the you know, metro bubble enterprise or, you know, successful business in this bubble, $10 a month might seem really nothing, right? Really nothing. If you're making 60, 80, $100 an hour at your job, more, six figures, mid six figures for some of us, $10 a month, eh. But what if $10 an hour in your world is an upper middle class living? $10 a month becomes prohibitive. Or at least something you got to think about. And there's no way you're going to spend 50,000 bucks for a SAS, uh, static analysis server. No way. It's not going to happen. And that number, by the way, every number I use is a real number. If I say it up here, that $50,000 for the server, that's a real number. A uh, company, at least when I was pricing them, that was their number for their server. The licenses for the desk, I think, were uh, 200 bucks a year. And then it was or 150, something like that. And then it was $50,000 for each server. And you had to have so many servers, so many users per server and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it was a two, three, four hundred thousand dollar $400,000 expenditure for that SAST. Now, that's kind of normal. By the way, it's not unusual to spend a million dollars for a tool for a year. And by the way, I once, I'm going to admit this in front of you, I once advocated for a tool for years, strategy papers, talks, everything, study, research, and we put it in and it didn't do what I needed it to do. Ah, it was a million dollar tool. You know, I have made mistakes really big ones. And they say that wisdom comes from experience and experience comes from making mistakes. Well, whatever wisdom I have has been from being, doing dumb things like that. Okay, so cost lockout. I've been talking about that for a long time. We really need to think about that, I think, as an industry, how we price things differently for different places or we're not going to be global. If every vendor chases the same Fortune 5000 companies, we have just not covered most programmers on planet Earth. Just boom, right there. Are you with me? Do, you, do you, we get the problem? OK, good. Thank you. Noise. Who suffers from false positive noise? Who suffers? Uh, come on. Break, put your hands up. It's all of us, right? And I'm sorry to the vendors in the room. But put your hands up. Vanda and I wanted to take a picture of that. Uh, yeah. This has been the bane of my existence. I put my first AppSec DAST, Dynamic Security Analysis Tool, in at Cisco in 2004. Very first one, 2004. This goes back to the you know, early days. And why? Because we had 2,800 apps, and we asked our, our pen testers how long they would take to pen test that, manually test it. And they said, oh, well, I think it took us about four years. Again, another problem with pen testing. Not that I'm against pen testing. Be clear. All my books say you should pen test as part of your program. Believe me, I'm not against pen testing. It's a scalpel, not scalable, OK? But noise, tools suffer from noise. Now, I know there's lots of people working on this problem because I've been talking to them. So maybe there'll be some real movements soon. I'm praying. It's only been, uh, what is that, 20 years, um, not quite. 
Um, yeah. So I have my tricks around that, and they're written in my books. I'm not trying to sell you books, but in case you want to know, just come up and ask me, and I'll tell you what I do about noise. Um, uh, because uh, when I got to McAfee, one team had 72,000 findings in their SAST queue. <laughs> you should see Sonia's face. It's priceless. It's absolutely priceless up here. 72,000 findings. You know how many they fixed, right? Zero. They told us we had to run SAST. This tool sucks. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, they, they, they check. Well, we got them running. So they were really getting stuff out of their SAST. And then they became my model team. You want to know how to run SAST? Talk to that team. They got it. Right? Of course. You take your worst team and you improve them. And then everybody says, Hey, you must have a successful program. Isn't that the secret? <laughs> um, keeping up with the DevOps. I just want to say, if you stick three, five DevOps tools in a darkened room overnight, there's a litter of 18 in the morning. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I cannot keep up. And now add Web3. I try to keep up on Web3 because my business, we do a bunch of blockchain stuff, uh, security, and I try to keep up, but I swear to you, the acronyms going by, I mean, and I'm in chat GPT constantly going, and tell me about this, and tell me about that. What is this? It's the, you know, total acronym speak. And I'm, I'm, I feel more and more like I'm running as fast as I can to keep up. Um, or AI. Same thing. There's a new prompt engineering tool, open source tool, almost every day. Almost every day. I haven't tried any of them. Um, so what's the state of our art? And I really love this picture here. Because look at the blue boxes. I hope those are coming out in blue there. It's blue in front of me. Um, it was meant to be blue or blue-ish. But look, this is an industry standard SDL. I know because I did research at Intel, uh, along with the amazing Bob Hale and the brilliant Catherine Blackadder Nelson um, about SDLs. And there is an industry consensus. Security development lifecycle, by the way, for those of you who don't know. Um, the stuff we got to do to secure stuff. This is the stuff we got to do, all of it in order to actually achieve reasonable security. Everything here. And I want to point out the difference between cryptography, maths, very technical. Even applied cryptography requires some serious technical chops. I know because I teach it. Um, and it takes a while for my classes to get it. And they all do, thankfully. Or fuzzing, which now there's some wonderful maths around that, which I don't understand. But um, you, know, you can talk to the fuzzers, people doing research around that. And teaching admins not to click on a fish. That's human behavior. Radically different. It's multi-domain, multi-discipline. What we have to do, not pick one from each square. Just pick one. Has anybody ever heard a dev team look at you and say, well, what do we have to do? And we come back. Um, wait, I want to show. No, I, I'll get back to it. OK, go back. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. Just think, if you come in to a dev, put yourself in the dev's space. I'm going to get to tools in a minute. That's not the next slide. Unfortunately, it would have been a great come on, but no, bad ordering. The thing is, you only give these talks once. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it's a hard problem. And it's a hard problem. I'll go back to the Turing proof and Turing complete languages, and if you want to know the computer science behind that. Um, so how do we touch millions? How do we touch? Honest question. I didn't say I'm the brilliant guy who has the answers. You're the brilliant people, and together we might have some answers. I just want to point that out. 
This is an honest question, which I'm asking myself, and now I'm posing to you. Tools. I want a revolution. I want a major revolution. Well, there's the false positives. I already put that. There's cost lockout. But there are too many. There are just too many. Too many technologies. And all those technology differences are there for a reason. But from the developer side, from the developer side, I just want to find my bugs. Isn't a unit test enough? No. And by the way, you know those security requirements we came up with in threat modeling? You have to test each one of those to see if they work right because it's easy. So all, remember, all software fails. But of course, security software never has any bugs, right? <laughs> right, we can really count on the firewall never to have a bug. Yeah, I'm glad you're laughing. I don't know. I have a suggestion box. I have a suggestion box. I do. A lot of vendors are finally doing either open source or community tool versions. And at least that gives an entry. I'm really happy with that. Because back when I started talking about this, which is mm, uh, too long ago, those didn't exist. I'm really glad about that to community versions. But some of those open source tools, anybody ran dash dash all in SEMGREP lately? You know, which one of those standards do I pick? I mean, SEMGREP's got, and I'm not picking on one tool here. I'm just naming that one because it's easy. You can put a GitHub action in and boom, you've got some SAS. Thank you, SEMGREP. I hope you guys are making a living and somebody's buying your tool. Um, but that's really important. It's really important that we have something we can tell people, you don't have any money, you can do this. But have you looked how many standards? Think about the, from the AppSec or the developer's perspective, which thing do I pick? Well, let's run, run all. Oh my gosh. All of this in my code? No. We got to make them a little easier to consume. We do. Um, I want to badger and harangue for more AppSec curriculum. Anybody go to a university that had a really rich AppSec program? Anybody in this room? Do you know why they let this guy with only a master's and no PhD teach at the University of Montana? Because they'd like to include a little computer security. As my, as my, the head of the department said to me one time, you know, Brooke, you're, and they call it in academia, your commercial experience. I love that, commercial experience. Um, who does open source? <laughs> you know, um, not all my experience is commercial, excuse me, um, but your commercial experience. If we took everybody in the department he literally said this, if you took everyone in the department and did their commercial experience, yours would be four times theirs. So that's why they let me go on in front of the students, whether I'm a you know, good teacher or a bad one. But can we get it in schools? People should be learning. And every code dojo, thank you, Chris Romeo. Do you know Chris spends time every summer going to Central Europe to teach both coding and security. Thank you. I, the rest of us? I'm not suggesting we all leap on a plane to Central Europe, but you know, that's the sort of activism that's going to change what we do. Seriously. Um, we can teach code mentor Tanya. Yep. Uh, you are the face of AppSec mentoring. You do realize that now, right? It's kind of that thing, you know, you, you, you're at work and they, they say, go figure this problem out and it's kind of slightly successful and you become that from that, the guru everyone comes and talks to you about and then you start actually, you've reached Mount Too Stupid and you fall down to the, I really don't know anything about this. That actually happened to me, by the way. I thought I was really knew a lot about security when I went to Cisco. 
because I'd been running uh, you know, some firewalls and stuff at my job as a secondary part of my job, setting up the VPN. We did have an incident, we had two incidents that were horrible. One involved child porn, it was absolutely dreadful. Um, and one much earlier where I had to take apart, I had to put together the operating system by hand to get rid of a worm, yeah. So did I earn my hacking credentials with that one, by the way? That was in 1994. Um, but yeah, so I'd been doing a little stuff and then I got to Cisco and was around people who actually do computer security and I you know, realized I knew nothing. So I read the first version of Hacking Exposed to and from work because I always take tr public transportation if I can. So I sat there or there reading Hacking Exposed so I could come up to speed and understand what these people were talking about. Um, that was in late 2000, yeah. Um, I was down in the valley of not knowing. Um, but ta teaching, mentoring, communities. Communities, okay? OWASP, obviously, duh, here we are. Start a chapter. And there's lots of other ones, meetups, ISA, Purple Book community. You know, here's the thing. A bunch of us said, we really ought to do something around threat modeling, just friends. And we said, who do we want to work with? Just more friends. Well, that's how the threat modeling manifesto happened, literally. You know, uh, Robert really has been doing this for a long time. Robert Hurlbut sitting, sitting right here. Thank you. Um, like that. Somehow one of my slides disappeared here. And I'm really sorry because I have a list I got of all the different tool categories that we normally tell AppSec people. And it's like 15. Imagine if you're an AppSec person and you come in, by the way, you need one of each. Really? No. Yeah, just put yourself on the other side of that. But this is my call to action to you. My deep call to action to you. Who better to take this up? the global problem, but you. And I'm not suggesting we carry signs in the street. It's just a great picture, right? I'm not suggesting that we need to demonstrate. But my call to action is get out there, teach, mentor, start a group, start talking to devs, go to code dojos, teach at university, or just do a little seminar, guest lecture. Before I started teaching, I was guest lecturing all over the place. Do something. Get out there, please. We have to reach the 20 million, or is it 40 million, I'm not sure, programmers who are not working at one of the Fortune 5000 or who have no AppSec program, no person like you to talk to. No person. That's my call to action to you to please do something, whatever. Find a group of friends, find a problem, and try to solve it. Maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Maybe you'll learn something. I don't know if AppSec is yet an existential human problem, but we're getting there. Thank you very much.